So tonight we'll have two speakers um, having a discussion about Islamophobia and the roots of the forces of Islamophobia in Minnesota politics. So as our introduction, we have um, the executive director of Faith in Minnesota and Isaiah Doran Schranz is over here, and Mohammed Omar, executive director of Dar al Farouk Mosque and Islamic Center in Bloomington. So we're going to start with a short video, and as a heads up, it does have some depictions of violence. Tolerance and anger have gripped parts of white America. Get a mask right now! You'll be the first one to get murdered by the Muslim! Assaults on Muslim Americans are increasing. Your prophet is perverted! An explosion at a Bloomington Islamic Center. Send them back to the dustbin they come from and let them go sit on a camel. I almost died just because I was Muslim. We saw the number of attacks of mosques, Muslim women and men across the country completely skyrocketed. Don't Trying to oppose the Sharia. This investigation traces the groups that promote Islamophobia, the fear of Muslims. Women raped on the streets of Germany because of unvetted Islamic refugees. Sharia law fully implemented, whether it's Europe or America, this is the goal. We exposed the tactics used to influence social media. Some of these numbers are staggering. Every day he's pumping this stuff out to huge audiences. And we reveal their connections to members of the Trump administration. I was speaking three or four times a week with Jeff Sessions, up to the election and after the election. Do you believe Donald Trump is an Islamophobe? Yes, I certainly do. You need to go and leave our country. If Muslims are attacking us, if Muslims are a threat, what do we do? The logical conclusion is violence. No, of um, how Faith in Minnesota works and kind of the story of where this comes from. Um, do you want to, Mohammed's going to start with that. Okay. Uh, hello, assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Mohammed Omar, I'm the executive director of Dar al Farouk Mosque. I'm a Bloomington resident and a father of six and a victim of Islamophobia. So I'll explain to you that as um, my mosque is 39 minutes away from here. And as every family, as everyone coming to this country, I came with my family hoping that I would build, rebuild my life, put together my dreams, which the country I came from, there was a lot of war, there's a lot of death, there's a lot of problems. So I was fortunate, those who came here, one of those who came here, and since I landed, I, once, when I came to this country, I, I remember that the first time I came, I was just telling Doran, I didn't know that much English, and I didn't understand even the, the airport announcer, I didn't know what he was saying, she was saying, and when I came, I landed the airport, and for the first time, I have seen thousands of thousands of white people. The first time, I mean, I'm like, where did I put myself? Or what's going on? And how do I deal with this? And how can I hide? I mean, I didn't know how to deal with it because I, as a human being, when you see people that you never saw before, because I came from Africa, I was I was born in Africa. I thought I visited more countries in Africa and I knew a lot, but I never had this experience. It was JFK. Airport, I landed, it was in the middle of the midday. And the first airport I, I, I landed, I, I, I was transited, it was in Belgium, 
and they had mosque, and they had like few people, and there was no one. So I asked, where's the mosque? And they told me, this is like by, by default. Like I'm, I just <laughs> asked, where can I pray? So I came to JFK, and everybody is like going crazy, and this is, everybody's white. So I'm like, how can I deal with this? And then I asked one or two people, nobody understood what I was saying, and that is the, like the experience I had when I was coming to this country. But I had hopes, I had dreams, and I was hoping that you know I would build my life because I had a lot of energy to you know work and do a lot of things. So I moved in Minnesota and I came to Bloomington and I start my family and me and my children. My, you know I live across my mosque, and this mosque for the last seven years we had huge problem with one or two or three neighbors who didn't like who we are, who didn't accept that we're different. So at this, like for the last seven years, we've been dealing, somebody taking pictures of us, somebody coming to the mosque, somebody's complaining about us, somebody's like, and this became so you know, normal and so we get accepted. And we said, if, you don't, if we don't talk to them and we don't say anything to them, Maybe they'll, I mean, this won't hurt us. Just let them take pictures of us. So we've been hiding and living that life, so just stay away from them, don't cause any trouble, and, and that life maybe works for us, and nothing happened until August 5th, 2017, that it was Saturday morning when someone came to our mosque and bombed, and I was literally in the next room. The room was bombed, was my, like, one window away from me. So that morning when I came, I was working at that night and there was a construction going on in our mass. And I was tired at 4 a.m. We were kind of welcoming a charter school, renting our building, and we had a new tenant. So I sat down in my couch and in that morning, 5 a.m., as I was waiting, the, the morning prayer, I kind of fell to sleep in my couch. The next thing I, I remember was a big blast, bomb, and I was half awake, half asleep, half shocked. For five minutes, I remember I didn't move from my, my, my couch. Somebody came into the room, one of our colleagues who were outside working in the construction, and he had to drag me out of the room because I didn't know what I was doing. I was just sitting there and I kind of, kind of hoping and understanding what happened. So I came out and look, looking around the building, I didn't know which room this thing happened because somebody, you know, the window was at the attack came from outside and the smoke is everywhere and there's a, the fire alarm went off, there's a sprinkle water everywhere. I just ran to the fire pan panel and I just checked maybe if I can see where the signal is coming from. So I found out that it's the Imam's room, which was next door to me. I came back and opened the door. There's a lot of smoke, I can't see anything. So all this is like I'm dreaming. I, this is not real. I don't know what happened. I don't know what, I, I never thought this is a bomb. I thought maybe something else happened, maybe electricity, maybe some shot, I don't know. But I never thought this is a bomb. So the fire department came, the first, I know that guy called, his name is Chris, he came to the building and he opened the room, room and he just investigated. He came out, he said, Mohammed, because we had a good relationship, he used to come every day when there's a fire, false fire, fire alarm. He said, Mohammed, there is something, this is, very different. I have never seen this thing in my life. So there is something happening in this room, and he didn't want to. He didn't want to escalate. He didn't want to say what, what it was because he didn't know. But he he saw there's a big hole in the room. There's a you know all, all the furniture like collapsed, and there's a lot of damage to the room. He said something terrible happened in this room. I don't know what it is, but I'll tell you one thing. Things may get excited, and it may not be only police and fire department. A lot of people may come, so I'm, I'm advising you, call whoever you can call, and just get some advice. Like, this is the fire department. I called you, I called 911. Who else should I call? I don't know. I mean, I, I was strange in this area. 
we've been dealing all this you no know, hate and you know somebody wrote created a blog about us and all these things we kind of ignoring it so everything came into in, in front of my face now so now where are we what's going on I called some, several of my imams who, are, who were my friends. None of them answered the phone because immediately media says something exploded in the mosque. And immediately our neighbors start saying, oh, they were preparing bomb and you know, now they ex get exposed and this is what's happening. And like you, it's like minutes, it's happening. So my first reaction was I talked to my friends, those I felt they have future. And young, I said, please go hide. This thing will get very, very, very ugly. And this thing will be like, we'll be on the news and people will come and they will blame us as usual. I'm, I'm not counting, I'm not I expect, expecting they will come and help us as a victim. What I mean, they, it's a whole system. I don't know who I'm referring. Everybody else except us. It's a whole world versus us because I knew I was, we were in an isolated mosque and we would not have, we didn't have a lot of, you know, people who were coming to us. People in, divided into two, those who are attacking you and those who are silent and don't even know you, don't even know about you. So who do you call, who do you ask, who do you talk to? So that, at that moment I called one of my, God, one of my friends who I thought he maybe knows some about the system and I, he used to do, I remember that this is what reminded me about him. He used to do uh, interfaith dinner and dialogue and all this, so I said, maybe this guy knows about white guys, so maybe he can call some of his friends. And somebody will come, will come and help us, because this is the system. It's telling us, police and fire department telling us, you know, hold on yourself, something will happen. I don't know. So I called this guy, he came, and he was very genius. I mean, I remember that day, he came to me and he said, Mohammed, you know what, let's go home. I said, why? He said, I want you to change this dirty clothes, Media will come, I want you to talk to them. I said, I don't even know English. I don't even know how to say what to tell them. He said, it's not about English. Just say whatever you feel and own your own narrative. Then I'll, I'll correct you and fix whatever you make mistakes. Then, at that moment I realized I am in the middle of this big mess and I have to face it. I have to do something about it. I went home, I changed my clothing, I came back and I, just said, okay, what should we do? And my police chief in our district, in our uh, city, came to me and he said, Mohammed, this is like an honest advice. He, I, I don't think he mean, you know, just to put us down or anything, but he said, I'm advising you, do not escalate, do not talk to the media until we figure out what's going on, here, what, what happened here. And my friend is telling me, no, We'll talk to the media and we'll tell somebody attacked us and this is arson and all this. I don't even know the word arson. Like what happened? What does arson mean? It's like when somebody you know fired you know someone. Else. This is in for me. I am living in a dream. I I'm just asking. I, you know maybe I, I will wake up and this is what this is all about dreams. And at that time I you know talk to the media. I try to kind of answer all their questions and. Nothing is changing. I mean, people, even the White House is saying this is hoax, this is left doing something. I don't know who's left, who's right, but everybody was like referring us as a left, but we, I knew that we got bombed. I knew that we were the victim, but I didn't know how to explain this into the real world and tell them that we are the victims. I don't know who's left, who's right. And things get, you know, very, you know, you know people like didn't believe us, including FBI were investigating our mask, and who was in the mask at that moment, and who saw who, and who did who, and all it became us versus, like, you know, and then we, our witnesses start, you know, uh, running away and, and, and hiding and saying, I didn't see anything. Why should I say I saw something and then this guy will come to my house every day and knock the door and say, I'm FBI. I mean, this is more horrific, you know, and terrible than me helping the mask. I'm telling you, I don't want to do anything. And we, we felt a little bit hopeless. I felt as a leader, how can I protect my kids? What should I tell my, my, my wife? Who is telling me, please don't go to the mosque anymore. This is the mosque that gave us the problem. This is this, this, I mean, you shouldn't be working at the mosque. 
I mean, the, why are you, why you put us in our lives in, into this danger zone where people are like attacking this place? And day after day, the investigation is coming out. They're saying this was AT, what is it called, a, um, ATF or, like they say this device was explosive device and they used in Iraq and now things are getting going bigger. And now they mentioned they're connecting Iraq and us and everybody and it's getting messier. And I don't know how to explain it. And my contractors stopped working at my school. And this is August 5th. Schools starting September 5th. I already you know, invited this um, uh, tenant, my new tenant, who, what, who will start and giving us some you know, uh, rent. So now two of their teachers on the spot, you know, they, they quit, they said, you know, we, we don't want to deal with this. And everything, like things went out of the hands. And I just you know, felt maybe you know, God will, will help you, but just you know, keep holding together and don't give up and push it. And then Imam Asad, my friend, called all his friends that morning and all these different religious leaders came. And that's the time I felt like that we were not isolated, we were not by ourselves. There are people out there who would respond and come to us in our support. So in that morning, almost 40 people came from uh, different you know, uh, religious background, Jewish you know, uh, rabbis and Christian leaders and one of the things I remember that morning was um, Minnesota Council of Church's you know, head, uh, I think Kurt Dian came, and he was kind of elected as a president a week ago from that incident, some, some like, something like that. And when he came, one of the, I think, politicians or, or someone from the city or somebody asked me, how did you get to know this guy? I mean, I mean somebody who knew him was asking me, how did you get to know him? And uh, we thought you guys don't know anybody. And now you know all these religious leaders. I don't, I don't know, but he came here in our support. And at that time, they called it what it was, which was a terrorist attack. Somebody attacked the mosque, and they said an attack of a religious institution is an attack of all religions. All religions. So it became, we changed completely the news, and the narrative got changed. And I felt a little bit relieved. And three days after that, we called a solidarity event, and 1,400 people showed up, 1,400 from our neighbors. I, was, I had a big smile in my face. I wasn't even that guy who was depressed like three days ago. Now I feel like I can say what, I, what happened to me. I talked to them, and it was a beautiful event. All the uh, politicians came, and from the senators to the governor to the all you know, state representatives, everybody came. And I was I feel like, okay, this is good. Okay, it was good, but when the event ended, then our neighbors start from there. So now they keep saying, okay, now the politics end, now they, they want to collect some money, and they want to get this, and the harassment started. And from there on, I don't know what to do, because everybody came, and everybody's in our, in our support, but they, the power is not in our hand, and it's not our side. So what should I do? I keep looking, I keep asking people, and I heard this, beautiful training called Isaiah, and I was like, what is Isaiah? And I kind of researched it, and I got to know it's an, one of the prophets, in, you know, the biblical prophets, and also in our books, in our Quran, he was one of the prophets. Okay, let me get to know them, let me go to them, and maybe this, I will get some answers from this training. So we went, it was a week-long training. My hope, my feeling was this will be another Know, long, boring training, and you just sit there, and you know they'll tell you how you know you get your leadership from your own, all these things. I, I don't know. I'll just sit down that evening. I'll leave. I'll, I'll, I'll leave maybe at night. It was I think Mankero, or yeah, it was Mankero. So that night, I sat down, and the first question I was asked was by by Doran. She asked that, "What's at stake?" I said, "We're bombed," and she didn't. I mean. It was like, okay, <laughs> so what, what happened? It wasn't like something, I felt the bomb was the biggest thing happened to us. I, th I thought the Islamophobia, the systematic racism, it's all, it's all this bomb, and the bomb was a symptom. It wasn't the cause, it was, it was the effect, it wasn't the cause. The cause was this, you know, uh, there's a system behind this thing, you know, uh, creating this hateful you know, environment 
where innocent or ignorant people getting and catching up this kind of feeling and they have never heard or saw a Muslim person and now somebody telling them this is your enemy. Just like the same you know, thing happened to me when I landed in JFK airport. I saw all these people, so what should I do? My brain was telling me, I mean, you guys know maybe computer, go to safe mode and that's it. And just protect yourself and be you and don't get close to nobody and you know, I don't know if there's real human beings or who they, I mean, but I turned into learning mode. Get to know them, they're different. Yes, you came to the different country, yes. So I start learning, get, getting to know them. That's the same way people are taking advantage of ignorant people, insecure people, and turning into enemies to each other because they have interest, they have something. They want just, you know, uh, get rich out of this. Uh, they see human beings as, you know, uh, business or as making money out of it. So that is where I felt as a leader, as you know, uh, somebody who went into that meeting, into that training, I didn't understand the real problem of ours. First of all, yes, I felt powerless, but my power and my powerless didn't come from people attacking me. It came from we are not doing and changing anything. We are not taking responsibility. We are not you know, uh, going out there and getting to know, I mean, organizing people and making people change about us, who we are and accept each other. And that's what I learned from that weekly training. I get to know something called power organization. I used to know organization as service organization, but they told me, whatever you guys do is not a power organization. So you need to ha have a power organization. Like, what is power organization? So it took another day or two to get to know what it means, getting one-on-one -on -one and something called preposition and I, you know, I learned a lot and I, it was eye-opening for me and immediately I talked to him and said, how can I be part of you guys? And he was like, they never thought about it. I mean, we were Muslim or congregations and my mosque, I was feeling like I am not protected. I was feeling like I am not, I don't have a protection. So I have to have somehow, some way, I have to get somebody who I can align with and we can, because police is telling me, get to know, call your people. And who's my people? So I get, I, I look, who can me be my people? Like, because all the politicians came to us and nothing happened, nothing changed. So from there, there on, I start organizing, getting to know what organizing means. We start uh, getting to know for the first time something called caucusing, caucusing, and we went out there and all you do is just raise your hand. You're not carrying a weight or you're not doing something. You want that, you walk in and you raise your hand and then you have power right there. You change something. And in the same training of that we try to educate our Muslim you know, fellows, then another attack came from this uh, crazy people saying, Muslims now infiltrating the system. They're trying to infiltrate the system. They're trying to, I mean, what system? I mean, I thought we are part of the system. I mean, you guys were blaming us. You, you are not assimilating. Now we want to be part of the system. We want, I mean, you guys now blaming us because we participate? No. So we said we didn't listen to them because this is what makes us powerless. So eventually we organized and we had, we got put together 10% of uh, DFL, you know, convention, uh, the entire state. We became 10%, us and all faith in Minnesota, from Muslims to Christians and everybody, all of us. And we, we saw the real change that we do in our, on our, on our, on our, like in our, in happening in front of our eyes. And then from there on, we put together another big event, I don't know if you guys heard, called Super E in US Stadium, US, US Bank Stadium. That's like 34,000 Muslims came together and prayed there. For the first time, we saw each other as we were dismayed. And we, we, we didn't even know that we like had this number and we could make a big difference. And then I, I mean, I, I, we went through a lot for the, I mean, that, those eight months, but we learned that if you don't change, if you don't, you know, own the change, and you don't move and, you know, uh, talk to the people and use the system and show up the night that people are voting, then you, your voice, you're giving it away from those who are oppressing you or us, and this is what I felt and this is how I get to know people like Doran and amazing people who are making things happen. 
and I would say if your daughter can say a lot, <laughs> so welcome. That's all I say, thank you, and I mean, I would say please be participate, and because of your silence, people like me can get hurt. Because of you are not doing anything, that means you're empowering the one who's doing everything bad. So if you, get, if you stand up and do something, and just all you do is go and vote, and vote those who you think protecting your values, and, and protecting people around people like me. So, and I would say, if you do that, then we all will all be, we will all see the Minnesota that we all like, look, like, likes to see. Everybody wants us to see. I mean, everybody wants to see a Minnesota that represent all of us. And that's what I would say. Please welcome Lord. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is George Franz. I am the director of Isaiah and Faith in Minnesota. Um, I'm gonna tell you, of, uh, how many people here, I have a couple of questions. So how many people here had actually heard of the bombing that happened at Dar al Farouk? Okay, quite a few. Okay, and how many people here have actually heard of Isaiah or Faith in Minnesota? Oh, wow. I've never been to St. Olaf before, so who knew? <laughs> um, and I would like to hear from a couple of people, like what brought you here tonight? Like why were you, why, what, what are you looking for in this conversation? Anyone? It could be short. Yeah. I mean, oftentimes when there are discussions of Islamophobia or white nationalism, they're kind of separated, and this is actually the first time I've ever seen the two words together in a single line, and I was like, Let's do that. Okay. All right, other people? Just like a post dinner, okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, I, let me tell you just a little bit about Isaiah, and then we're going to dive in and just keep building off the story that um, Muhammad started. So Isaiah is a faith-based organizing organization. How many people here have heard of organizing, like community organizing? Some. Okay. So um, Isaiah uh, started last year a second organization called Faith in Minnesota. So Faith in Minnesota is a sister organization to Isaiah um, that is exercising its power doing political organizing. So it is a more explicit, um, uh, it gives us the ability to more explicitly engage in the political arena. So you'll hear us kind of using interchangeably Isaiah and Faith in Minnesota, but those are the two functions. So Isaiah organizes faith communities or congregations, and we, um, you heard Muhammad say a little bit earlier, power organization. So we operate explicitly um, under the, uh, around the analysis that in order to change things, especially big things, like whether we're talking about poverty or racism or Islamophobia, the problem that we're facing and communities are facing is not just the interpersonal engagement that's happening between people, like the bad neighbors of Jar al Farouk, but it's also because communities don't have enough power to change the conditions in which they live. And the conditions in which we live are actually constructed by the decisions and interests of powerful, like either powerful people or powerful institutions. So the thing that we experience every day, whether we're talking about why is this street have the trash not picked up? Why does this street seem to have houses that don't like have good roofs? Why is this apartment complex have rats in it? and that apartment complex over there does not. Why is it that this part of the city seems to have clean water, but that part of the city does not? Why is it that Flint never doesn't have clean water to this day, but it would never happen in Mendota Heights? What is the difference between these places? It's not the weather. 
And it's not an accident. It's because of differentials in power. And power is something that happens when, um, I mean, very simply, we talk about it as either organized people, so organized interests, so a large corporation can have power, a political party has power, um, there's all kinds of different vehicles through which people operate to have power in the world. It's also organized money. Does money have power in our politics these days? Yes. <laughs> Has anyone heard of the Koch brothers? Right? So, so when we think about how we're going to make change, having a conversation, I mean, not having a conversation about power in the context of having a conversation about change doesn't really make any sense. So what we do is then ask the question of how do you build power? So power isn't something that you as an individual can have. You can, you can um, just by yourself. <laughs> you have, a lot of times people think of the way I make change might be to vote or a personal decision that I make, like whether I shop at this store versus that store, consumer power. But most of the ways that people, regular people, build a pathway to power is they have vehicles or organizations through which they can exercise it. So a labor union is an example that a lot of people have either like seen or heard of or you know it's like in history. Labor unions are vehicles through which a wor workers in a place and then in, in, through industry can actually negotiate their interests. So a labor union is an example of a vehicle through which ordinary people, regular people can have power. So Isaiah, rooted in our values and rooted in our faith, and rooted in what we believe towards racial and economic justice in Minnesota, organized collectively by developing the capacity and leadership of people. So it's not like smart, it's not about hiring smart people to go do stuff for you. It's actually people in Dar al Farouk, people in St. Matthew's Lutheran Church, people in St. Thomas More Catholic Church, people in First United Church of Christ here in North, Northfield. People in those places themselves being on a path to being the leaders and the voice for the thing that, that, that needs changing. And they are the ones who drive the path. Not, not an advocate, not a lawyer, not a policy expert, not a smart guy in DC. <laughs> we will use all those people, right? But the people who are driving the organization are the people who make up its membership. Does that make sense? Okay, so that is basically how we think about the work that we do. So in that context, let's go back to the question of Islamophobia and white nationalism. Who's benefiting? What does white nationalism, or you saw the beginning of the Al Jazeera, Islam, do you know they call it Islamophobia Inc? Does anyone know? Does anyone have a guess? Who's benefiting? Yeah. Okay, so there's political interests. And who's an example of somebody whose political interest has been met by feeding Islamophobia and white nationalism. Yes, we can name names. <laughs> Our current president. Our current president. And what evidence do you have that that's true? Uh, there are some videos out there. I don't have specific quotes. Like that. Okay, so it's, you're saying based on some things that he said. Yes. Okay. All right. Other examples that people have, or other evidence that our current president? Okay. Uh, like okay, so tell us a little bit about Jason Lewis. Um, I've just heard you said very, like, uh, bad comments. Okay. <laughs> I can't remember. Okay. Um, I've heard you say that you can't. And does everyone know who Jason Lewis is? Jason Lewis is the congressperson for this district right here. So he represents you in Congress, Jason Lewis. He used to be a radio talk show host. Um, and he built up an audience base as a radio talk show host. And then in 2016, I don't know, woke up to, maybe he had a dream 
He woke up, he was like, I'm running for office. And now he represents you. You should look him up and hear about the things that he says. On, although you can't see him in a town hall meeting. Why is that? He's scared. Yeah, he does not do those. <laughs> okay, who else, what, what else would you say? Who's, who's benefiting? What's your analysis about why this is happening? Yeah. Just like white people in general. Okay. Like people who like don't really want to talk about like their own whiteness and acknowledge that it's like a thing that matters too. Yeah. So there is a lot of people who um who are white who benefit from this either the silence or the or or their or they themselves uh, uh, the silence and they they think that maybe if things change their advantage will go away. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Other examples. Yeah. Blaming a group for problems created by other groups. So tell me more about that. Political, economic, other interests who are doing lots of harm and making lots of money, increasing inequality. Yeah. Blaming a group. Like a scapegoating. Yeah. So that, that's what I, is that right? Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah, so if you scapegoat and you can create a conversation about that, so let's give an example. This US Congress that got elected in 2016, what was their primary agenda in Congress? Do you guys, do you guys read the paper? <laughs> <laughs> what what is the main like like thing they wanted to do? Repeal the Affordable Care Act. Yes, repeal the Affordable Care Act. So that was like mission number one, and then there was mission number two. And um, the Speaker of the House, uh, Paul Ryan. Do people know who he is? So Paul Ryan um, was quoted in the newspaper before he drove this agenda saying, I've been dreaming since the beer keg in college where I could cut Medicaid and Medicare and Social Security. Did anyone remember that quote? Sort of, yeah. They passed the biggest tax cut ever. And who got the most of their taxes cut? The, t the most wealthy in the, in the country, and businesses. Now there should be some, some argument, anyway, we can have like a tax debate, like there's some, so there was some, actually some things they did in terms of corporate tax cuts that one would argue might have been the right thing. But there, the, that, the question is, someone ran on, if we're just gonna put aside the moral argument for a second, there was a running on deporting 11 million immigrants, passing a Muslim ban, uh, sort of like criminalizing uh, people of color, kind of mass, you know, kind of the idea of like, like mass incarceration, police. Have we deported 11 million immigrants? No. There was an attempt to move the Muslim ban. And there is a reworking inside the Department of Homeland Security that is absolutely systematic and it is absolutely targeting Muslims and people of color. But the main thing Congress did was pass, try to repeal the Affordable Care Act and pass a giant tax cut. So there's a mismatch, getting to what you're saying, between the agenda that's being discussed in the public arena and what is, what the, what, in terms of like what it is that people are talking about. And then over here, the actions that politicians are doing are actually a different agenda. Why would that be? Yeah. Yeah, so they're playing on people's fears, this kind of scapegoating, right? And it is used as, um, it's a pow power that's been arrayed over the last 10 or 15 years, right? Where what we do is we use, um, there's a big conversation that, that sort of says that Muhammad and his mosque is the problem. 
And maybe, white person, part of the reason you can't afford your health care, or you're having a hard time sending your kids to college, or you, your own economic life is actually declining, it's because of him. Instead of because of the way that we've structured our economy or because of, right? So that, 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 that's the conversation that unfolds. And in the United States of America, because of our history, because of 400 years of racism, it's a very potent argument. So the question becomes, we just talked about this really big national picture. How is Islamophobia, Inc., playing out in Minnesota? So we just heard a story of the consequence, one of the consequences, where Darl Farouk was, how long was it after Donald, of the 2016 elections? It might have been 11 months. Okay, so that happened. And there has been like intensive surveillance that has happened before that and through it of the Somali community and the Muslim community in Minnesota. The FBI, like very engaged. <laughs> so there has been a targeting for some time. How is, how is this playing out in Minnesota? Do you have examples? Does it play out here at St. Olaf or in Northfield at all? How is Islamophobia playing out here in Minnesota? Everyone knows about it, and so um, and when you say not everyone knows about it, you mean people who are not experiencing that on a day-to-day -day basis because they're white or not Muslim don't notice it. Yeah. Okay. So that's one way it's playing out. How do you see it playing out, like in the news, on the radio, on Facebook? Do you see? Have you seen? Have you seen it? Yeah. Sometimes videos go viral, like there was, there was recently a woman that was um, searched very thoroughly in the airport um, because she wore a headscarf and that was um, particularly like shocking because in the video like they elaborate on her background like she was a student at Harvard and all these kinds of details and it just like it's something that a lot of people experience and, and for it to be implemented like from a higher power like airport security or the yeah. government or the police or any of that and for people to witness it happening coming from that higher power mm -hmm. it kind of almost normalizes it or gets people who may not be in that mentality thinking, exactly. oh, like this is, this is what we need to do. Right, so there's been a dynamic in which um, that kind of behavior, so a behavior that might have happened or you know, people might feel a certain way, but they didn't feel permission to act on it. Seeing people in power, like whether we're talking about the T TSA at the airport or police officers, doing that systematically gives permission, it starts to create social permission for people to engage in what you're describing, <laughs> even more than they would otherwise. I'm not saying they wouldn't otherwise, but like even more than they would otherwise. It's like, it's okay now, it's normalized. Other examples, like in the news, yeah. Isn't like Fairbo getting sued for housing discrimination against Molly? I think that's true. Do you know anything about that? that in Faribault, um, there's there's a lawsuit about housing discrimination towards Somalis. Yeah, that's an example. There's there's actually housing in Wilmer, Faribault, St. Cloud, and in the cities is a very, very contentious issue that's playing out. Do have people, has anyone here been to St. Cloud? Did anyone know what the big debate is at the city council in St. Cloud right now? They're actually trying to, as the city council, advance a Muslim ban. Can city councils do a Muslim ban? The answer is no. <laughs> but that is the active conversation that's going on. So uh, the mosque in St. Cloud, a whole set of congregations are working together to actually push a counter story. But this is an active debate. And I think that like, basically the way that the elections are gonna play out this fall 
has a lot to do with that is actually the local public conversation that's happening in the city council. It's not a conversation about, say, paid sick days or what are we going to do about housing or are we going to pick up the trash on time. It's a conversation in a local city council about the Muslim ban. Another example is, I don't know if anyone has tracked this, um, uh, the Somali, uh, um, there is an organization, an association called the Minnesota Minority Child Care Association, and there are 76 child cares across the state of Minnesota. They're owned and run predominantly by Somali women. And um, they do child care um, through a child care assistance program. So if you have children and your income is below a certain level, there is something called a child care assistance program that gives you some subsidy in order to be able to afford to send your children to child care. Now many of you may not have children yet. Child care is one of the most expensive things for any family, white, black, or brown, in terms of, um, like, it's like, I'm telling you, it's a lot of money. Okay, <laughs> so child care assistance is a very important public program. It is deeply underfunded. There's 17,000 people on the waiting list. So this is a major way that people both take care of their children and these child care centers are run by and for Somali children. So it's culturally appropriate. It's like, it's the right place for kids to go, right? So uh, a set of legislators at your state capitol decided to move a story with Fox 9 News that what was happening is that Somali child care owners were committing fraud, putting cash that was for public assistance for child care into suitcases, putting, taking suitcases full of cash on planes to fly that cash to Somalia to fund terrorism. This story was supported by officials inside the Department of Health and Human Services of the state of Minnesota. This story broke, and the day that it broke, there was a hearing at the state capitol. So, so that, is, that, that normally doesn't happen. You don't have a story and then immediately a hearing because it takes a little while to like organize a hearing at state capitol. So what does that tell you? That was planned. Meanwhile, there are a set of politicians who already had already cut the story into political ads. So now if you go onto Twitter or you watch people's story, you, you kind of go on and look at political ads, you will see that a major issue in this election in order, right, to create a picture of what is happening to public programs of childcare, connecting that directly to women of color and then connecting that directly to terrorism. Now, I am going to tell you that this is nonsense. Okay? Somali women and child care centers, A, if you wanted to get suitcases full of cash, it is not the place to make a lot of money. That would be number one. If you would like to stuff suitcases full of cash, child care centers are not the way to go. Okay? People can barely make ends meet. Most people who are running childcare centers don't pay themselves because there's not enough. You cannot make, you, it's very difficult to make the business work. Number two, the, the newspaper article conflated like five different issues. But what was clear, both when we saw the precinct caucuses or when we see this happen at the state capitol, is there's orchestration of people with interest to advance the story. So that gets us to like where we're at right now in terms of this year in um, Minnesota, we are, headed, we are in the middle of, a, of an election. So people might be on different sides around the question of tax policy, around the question of um, the role of the market or the role of the state, or could you make government more efficient, or like there, there's, there's a whole bunch of legitimate debates that have happened over the years about those kinds of things, right? Do we think childcare, some like child care assistance programs, are something that we should be investing public dollars in or not? Right? Like that is a that's a fair conversation that we could be having. What is an immoral conversation, I would argue, is a conversation that's not that at all. 
It is not a conversation about the role of public dollars. It's a conversation about who's to blame that incentivizes the kind of feelings that, uh, that, that create social permissions, that scapegoat certain groups of people in order to animate racism, in order to advance a political agenda. That has been white nationalism, which is an ideology, has been electoralized. And that's the choice in front of us this year in Minnesota. It's not really about anymore the, 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 the kind of other questions I'm putting on the table, the role of the state, the role of markets. What we're saying in Faith in Minnesota and in Isaiah in different ways is that we have a larger struggle in front of us. That we want to get to the conversation about how we fund health care, how, how we deal with poverty, how we deal with child care, how everyday families are putting food on the table. But if we're having a conversation that is essentially rooted, and I'm gonna use these words, okay, that is essentially electoralizing and building power for the benefit of some, of a few people, through white supremacist arguments and white nationalism, Islamophobia, and racism, that has to be repudiated at every, at every, every level, from the top all the way to the bottom. And when we see that happening, we have to call it out. And that's something that we do through organizing. It's part of how we can, for example, um, Mohammed mentioned this earlier, we organized people publicly, Christian and Muslim, to go to precinct caucuses. So precinct caucuses is where you go um, when there's an election year and people can go into there and then you end up kind of basically moving through the system that's, that ultimately ends up in an endorsement in a party. But we did this in both parties. We had people go in just with their agenda. We trained people all over the state. We trained probably 4,000 people how to go, how to do it, completely nonpartisan. And there was a video that was put up of one of those trainings that happened in a mosque. And they put the video up because some people couldn't come to the training, and so they wanted to put the video up so if you couldn't come to the training, you could watch this video, you could watch it on Facebook, and go to the training. Three legislators, um, one legislator sent a tracker to that training. They went to the Facebook page where the video was, and multiple legislators posted it on their Facebook page now these are public people, these are public servants, posted the video on their Facebook page saying Muslims are infiltrating, they're infiltrating the political process in Minnesota. This video went viral, it was watched 45,000 times. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of vile comments on this video. That were everything, there was a white woman in the video and an imam and it was both extraordinarily misogynistic, <laughs> extraordinarily racist, and extraordinarily Islamophobic. It was all the things. So an instinct you can have in that moment, which we wrestled with as an organization, was we should just take it down. It's so terrifying and so controversial, we should just take it down. And instead, we said, absolutely not, we're gonna take it down. That is, what actually what's in the video is like normal. That is normal. That is people deciding they wanna to participate together in their democracy, that's normal. And then we went on offense. We did a press release. We actually sent face screenshots of all those Facebook posts to a set of bloggers that we knew around the state. We immediately organized a press conference that we did at Dar al Farouk with like, I don't know, maybe a hundred clergy and people. And what we announced is that was actually a phone bank night that we were gonna do together because we were gonna invite more of our friends and neighbors to come with us to precinct caucuses. And then all of the candidates for governor had to come out and make a comment about this because it hit the Star Tribune. 
And then the head of both the Democratic Party and the, and the GOP had to come out and they basically had to make public statements that there actually indeed was no religious test for participating in the political process in Minnesota. And then all of a sudden people's Facebook posts started disappearing off their Facebook page. Luckily we had screenshots. And pretty soon people were embarrassed because they got caught and called out. And we, our alignment, was more powerful because of that. So that, basically what we're doing right now is thinking of every opportunity to call out that question. Because it's not just about whether or not people vote. It's about how we embody the alternative vision that we have that we think isn't, it isn't about left or right anymore. <laughs> it's about the moral compass that we have. But what politics means and whether or not we're actually gonna be on a path about all people having dignity and all of that in this, but, but if we tolerate that other thing, it is a, it is a, it's toxic and degrading to our political life. And we have to understand that um, some people benefit from it. So, that being said, should we just open it up to questions? I don't know what Emma wants to do. Okay. Okay, if anyone has a question, raise your hand and I'll run the microphone over to you. The questions can be about anything we've covered tonight. <coughs> yeah. I, I would. Uh, first, thank you both for coming and Emma for organizing this. Um, I'm wondering maybe about between uh, August when the bombing happened and up to today, kind of ongoing sort of things that, that the Islamic Center and MAMA, what you're, you're doing, in other words, you guys have given us a great picture of the particular event and what Faith in the Southern and I are doing, but I guess maybe filling in between, like kind of on, ongoing other details, examples, of what's been going on in Minnesota, and as a lead in to say, how can people here get involved? If that makes sense. So um, I heard two questions in there. So one was kind of like, how, like how have we organized our like? So I mean, concretely, in the last year and a half. <laughs> We built um, something called the Muslim Coalition of Isaiah. So concretely what that's meant is there's about 20 or 24 mosques in different parts of the state who have actually joined together to be connected to Isaiah, but also its own vehicle. Um, and through that, along with the other kind of constituent parts of Isaiah, so we have um, child care organizing, we have congregations kind of all over the different parts of the state, different regions. We together built like a, basically an agenda that came from the different parts. So like, what does it mean concretely to fight Islamophobia? What would be our agenda for the next governor of Minnesota, for example? Like if the next governor of Minnesota was serious about fighting Islamophobia, what would he or she do? Um, or we have another, we have the same thing around a care agenda. So child care, paid family leave, and people were involved through house meetings and other things, um, other kind of vehicles to, to actually create that agenda. And that's what we brought into the political process with all the candidates that we're, we're relating to. And because we represent a lot of people and we consistently demonstrate that we can move those people, we garner the attempt, I mean, we, we can have a negotiation with candidates, right? So we've been in the midst of negotiating our agenda um, with the current candidates. Um, and right now what we're doing, and you know, part of what Apple will talk about a little bit, um, we're engaging people um, uh, all over the state uh, in um, both really moving the people in their lives and in their congregations and in their communities around the conversation that we're having here tonight, um, and also, and to vote. 
Um, and our goal is to uh, get as many people to vote as possible kind of around this agenda and to really move a bigger conversation. So you see we're in this button, which is later than here. So we really feel like we're, we have to build like a large scale public discourse. Um, and then we're going to have, um, like this Saturday, we're, we're meeting with Tim Walls and Peggy Flanagan around that agenda. And then um, we'll be engaged in the legislative session. And I, I read, um, on the other hand, you know, minority communities, especially my East African and Muslim community, you know, once, when, you, when you are the, the receiving end of this you know, attacks and hate, it's very easy for our community to hide and kind of not do anything or kind of you know, lose hope and feel like there's nothing you can do about this thing. So as a mosque that we were kind of uh, showing them as an example that we, we have been attacked and we never knew how this system works and now we're just, we, we, we're changing things and uh, we invited more imams to that you know, magic training, weekly training to Isaiah and things are kind of evolving and imams are kind of you know, waking up and, if you don't know imam, imam is the or mosque, and so it's like a priest or a clergy. So, and East African community is, I mean, we have, we have dealt wars. I mean, we went through a lot. And as, when you come to the United States, it's very easy for you to, you know, mind your business and hide, because this is the, a time for you to feel a little relaxed. And I mean, for someone, someone like me, I have been in a refugee camp. I, you know, worked days and nights just to, you know, save myself. And I was young and with my family and my mom, and I didn't know why we, this is happening to us. So when we came here, it was much easier for me not to do anything because doing something needs to be getting yourself in a danger zone or, you know, harming yourself. So that was the default that our community had. And once, you know, this tragic bomb happened, I and mean, we have learned the other side of the, of the I mean, Minnesota community, especially those few people who came all the way from Illinois who bombed us, actually did a favor for us because they wanted to divide us and to tear us apart. But what happened opposite, the people came together. But now, when we came together, my community are hiding. Even from that day that everybody was coming as a solidarity with Dara Farouk, Dara Farouk my community didn't feel safe to come to support in their mosque because you know they didn't understand what happened. They didn't get exactly who did it and why. But now we went back, organized mosques, you know, talked to the imams. It took me sometimes hours and hours to convince one imam just to show him how he, you know, hiding is making him more powerless and not doing anything for his for his community and coming out talking to his people, you know, encouraging his people to go and vote. I mean, I, this is the concept I didn't even have, you know, before. Even if you don't vote with whichever candidate you vote, there is a statistic always that shows how many East African people should you know, vote. And if, like, for example, 2016 Somalis or East Africans, 24,000 Somalis vote, and 2018, 40,000 people vote. What happens, the politicians, when they are making their decisions, even if you didn't vote for them, they will have in mind, this is the number who can vote. If you do crazy thing, then you may lose your thing. So, I mean, that is the thing that we're a part of it, kind of making them understand it, because it's very hard for somebody to tell you, as a vulnerable person in your mosque, you know, it's getting scared from your neighbor and not not to know what to do with your neighbor. Somebody comes to you and, and tell you, you know, you can change the states, the situation of Minnesota or the status quo of Minnesota. You can't you can't believe easily. It's not something you can easily believe it. But you what you can do is, I mean, I was just telling them in Bloomington, this this election happened. This guy and this guy, they were kind of you know, having uh, the the win was the winner got eight votes over this guy. So how many houses in your household can vote? He said like nine, okay, you could just defeat this guy just by your family. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you think the system is so complicated and you understand how to choose where to go, but you don't know if you and your friend can walk 
to the voting night, night, night and this, the election night and you vote, you may change the entire election. That's why they say every vote counts. So that's how my community, that they were feeling powerless. Now they understand, okay, this guy and this guy, okay, now what do you think? I mean, I just like, you go, they go back to the list and who you know, won 2016 and how many voters they had in St. Cloud. There's this guy who is, you know, uh, kind of coming out every single time, crazy idea and making, you know, our lives miserable. He only have 300 votes in one last election. And St. Cloud district, school district has 34% of Somali you know, students. So this is crazy. I mean, you guys are here, you can, you can kick out, you can fire all these politicians and hire another one. <laughs> And that's what we're trying to kind of, you know, between the bomb and now, I would say that was the job I was doing. <laughs> so my message to you is don't see yourself as a small person. I mean, I do not lose hope. You can change. If you do, I mean, if you go ahead and, I mean, and, and work with your friend and bring like 10 people at the, the election night and you vote, I mean, you can change the entire election. So my message to you, please do go ahead and vote and change the, the whole thing. I mean, this thing, everybody hates it. I mean, everybody, nobody likes politicians, but nobody does anything about it. Everybody complaining about it. You ask from left to right, every one of them is complaining about politicians. And at the end of the day, the politicians don't the run everything. So if we want to change, we can change through taking action, doing something. So if you do something, if you go ahead and vote, you can change. So. Well, I think this is the perfect transition point into <laughs> action steps about what you can do individually to build collective power. So we've learned about kind of the context of how Islamophobia and white supremacy plays out in Minnesota. I know for myself, before I became involved with Faith in Minnesota, I really didn't have any clue how prevalent and how blatant the racism and Islamophobic attitudes were in Minnesota. And that's because of my own privilege, and that's because of my own ignorance. However, I think it's really important that we all stay vigilant about it and that we choose to act in the face of Islamophobia and to make a difference. So, like Muhammad was saying, we each here have an opportunity to talk to people who are eligible voters. Not all of us are eligible voters, understand that. But we all understand what it means to build collective power and we have the opportunity to fight the forces that are causing fear and division in our politics in Minnesota and across the country, and to change that conversation by saying, we're not gonna listen to that anymore. So, um, we're gonna pass around some sheets that have information about how you can come involved. So, as part of the Faith in Minnesota Student Coalition, you can join me on Thursday afternoon in the cage, and I'm going to get some cookies or coffee, and we can sit down and message people in our own social circles and send text messages or Facebook messages to start having conversations about what our friends are doing on November 6th. And at this gathering on Thursday, we'll learn um, some effective and like efficient ways to have these conversations with people and um, talk to them about what's happening in our state and asking like, hey, um, Becky, like you've been friends for a while. I know you care about Islamophobia. Have you ever done anything about it? How would you like to vote with me on November 6th? Those kind of conversations are just as powerful and effective as these forces that we're up against in Minnesota. 
So we have a couple of opportunities for you to join us in um, building our network and joining this vehicle that will carry through the election. And then you can also be part of the conversation of what Faith in Minnesota and Isaiah will fight for in the legislative session in 2019. So I invite all of you to fill out these um, sheets and hand them in before you leave, especially so we can have contact information. And um, maybe we'll also do extra questions so we have a little extra time. That's a great idea. So one thing we skipped over earlier. We can, um, oh, right now have a conversation with those around you about what are some of the ways that you see the fear and division play out in maybe what you see on social media or in um, like conversations that you hear that really show how it's easy to be <coughs> inactive in politics and maybe standing up and choosing to step into your power and vote is like a tough choice. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Great.